Good afternoon. How are we? Good. Oh, we can do better than that. Time to go get some Red Bull, wake up a little bit, maybe go get some more beer. That's, that's always a good thing. Um, so how many people have made it over to CTF? Just go check it out, right? You should. You should go, go look at it. It's fun, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so we've, we've heard a little bit about CTF with this giant thing earlier, and you're going to talk a little bit more about this? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? Good stuff. Let's give these guys a uh, big round of applause. All right. Uh, whoa, I sound really loud. Um, welcome to our talk. Uh, we're here to talk about some work we've been doing um, in the context of our CTF team, in the context of uh, security research, and in the context of the CDC and open source. Um, we're here to talk about uh, anger, and we'll get to that later. But first, uh, who are we? Um, up here is uh, me. I am Zardis. This is Fish. Um, yeah. So uh, we are from uh, Shellfish. Uh, Shellfish is a CTF team. You can go check us out. We're playing the CTF right now on the uh, DEF CON floor there. Uh, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting hard. <laughs> Shellfish style. As you'll see, so this talk is full of like these live demos. Uh, we're going to try to solve some uh, CTF challenges, uh, show how we approach CTF challenges with this sort of framework. You'll see uh, true shellfish style, everything melting down completely. So uh, I'm sure there'll be exceptions and sec faults and a lot of really fun stuff. Um, but the point is, something very analogous is currently happening on the CTF floor. You know, of course, we always come super like badass and prepared, and you know, then the game starts. Zero SLA. Yeah. If if we don't have zero SLA, then something is horribly wrong. Um, anyways. Uh, we're Shellfish, um, and we're also from uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, at UC Santa Barbara, we have a really awesome uh, hip computer security lab. Um, and that's where Anger was created. Um, the main uh, people that uh, created Anger, the major contributors, um, me and Fish, we got uh, Relmot, um, also known as Andrew Dutcher. He's an undergrad currently at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, amazing dude. We got Nezorg, uh, also known as John Grosson. Um, he's a high schooler at uh, a high school in Santa Barbara, Dos Pueblos High School, which is totally crazy. And he's the leadest one of us, probably. Um, we got Chris Sauls, also known as Sauls. It's very creative. Uh, he's a fellow PhD student. And then Christoph Hauser, known as Karyos. I uh, was a postdoc. Uh, so this is kind of the, the anger team. Um, as for me, I've been uh, coming to DEF CON since DEF CON 9. Uh, back in uh, the Alexis Park, it, it was awesome back then. It's awesome now. Um, and it's kind of a lifelong dream for me to be up here speaking. This is, this is really crazy. It was a lifelong dream for a while to even play CTF. I'd walk by the table and, whoa. Um, and now we're here. and, and it's awesome to be here in front of you guys. Uh, like I said, I'm a PhD student in Santa Barbara. Uh, and I'm actually there because of CTF. So uh, Shellfish is mostly from UC Santa Barbara. And I joined them for a DEF CON qualifier and then got pulled in and then got pulled into the lab. So that was pretty cool. And uh, I let my uh, friend Fish here introduce himself. That's easier to just grab the mic. All right. Uh Okay, you guys can hear me. Oh, it works. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I'm Fish, obviously. This is not my real name. And I don't think you guys can read my real name if you're not from China. It's pretty hard to read. Uh, the pronunciation is Wang Ruoyu. Anyone not from China can read it? Probably not. Okay, you guys are honest. So uh, I'm, a, I'm also a uh, PhD student from, from UC Santa Barbara, and I'm a part of uh, Shellfish, which is a super lead uh, hacking team, as Jan has mentioned several times. Super famous for everything melting down okay. and nothing works and zero SRA. Yes. But so, at least they're super famous. Yes. And um, I've been playing, I've been playing DEF CON CTF for, this is my fourth year. Uh, I've been playing CTF 
like not DEF CON, but like I'm, I've been playing CDL for like six years. And I'm not a, I'm not a pawner. I'm not a, I'm mostly a reverser. So yesterday I just solved my first DEF CON CTF challenge because it's, it's a pawnable. I just solved it, solved it. This is like the first one out of four, out of four years. So you know, I'm very happy. And to solve that challenge, I didn't really sleep last night. So, um, and English is not my mother tongue. And if I talk about some nonsense today, don't be surprised. And okay, that's it. That's a little bit about me. And I'll head back to you. All right. So uh, here's a detailed itinerary for today. Um, we will uh, probably fail completely at sticking to this. Um, so we'll go over why uh, we need a next generation binary analysis platform, why we built it, why we're, uh, spoiler alert, releasing it. Um, then we'll uh, talk about uh, what, what we designed it to do. Um, we'll talk about the different parts of our uh, analysis system. It's called Anger. Um, we'll uh, talk about applications of it, show off some uh, CTF challenge um, solving or how it can assist in solving CTF challenges. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the open source release. Um, um, may I ask? Any of you, is, are any of you guys playing the CTF right now? Uh, raise your hand. One, two, oh, a couple of them. Okay. So you don't want to leave before the talk ends. Uh, unless you're not on Shellfish, then you should leave before we get to the live example. Um, okay. So um, let's uh, jump into that. Why Anger? Why uh, did we build a binary analysis platform um, mostly from scratch instead of uh, using one of the ones available out there right now, right? In fact, there's tons of them out there. When preparing this talk, I went through, I uh, saw what, what's our competition kind of, right? Um, and they're enough to fill an entire slide, right? Um, when we started Anger uh, about two years ago, there weren't this many, there's still some. Um, but then and now, in the end, uh, everyone ends up staring at binaries in IDA. So IDA, since it uh, came out in about 2005 or so, or Hexrays was founded in 2005, um, IDA has been kind of the de facto uh, binary analysis um, tool that everyone uses. So of course, our long-term goal is to, um, you know, replace IDA because it's from working with IDA quite a lot. It's, it's sometimes very frustrating. We've all had these moments of why is it doing this? Why, why did they design it that way? Um, but the truth is designing an analysis tool is extremely difficult. Uh, we're nowhere near uh, replacing IDA, for example, but there are things we do that IDA does not, um, and things we do and ways we do them that um, no other system out there uh, is capable of. Um, of course, the likely situation is we'll release this, and uh, then that slide with all those names will just have one more name on it. But hopefully, people find it useful. Uh, at least we do, so we're pretty excited. Um, so let's talk about uh, the fundamentals of Anger. What, what did we design it to be like? Well, the idea is we are all um, Python users, mostly in the lab. Um, and let's have a show of hands. Who, uh, who uses Python as a kind of primary hacking language? All right. So Anger is written in Python uh, for Python in, in some sense. Uh, it's meant to be used in IPython while you're working on a binary. Uh, that gives it a lot of flexibility. Um, and it exports its uh, analyses, which are pretty powerful, in a really well-designed way. We'll show off um, later. Uh, you know, how to use Anger uh, to quickly script symbolic execution, quickly script, you know, the finding of ROP gadgets and uh, so forth. Um, and, uh, of course, a core component of any modern analysis uh, system is that it has to work on platforms other than x86. So, in fact, by leveraging uh, an intermediate implementation uh, called VEX, which is how uh, Valgrind actually works as well, um, we support the 64-bit and 32-bit versions of all major architectures. And uh, after uh, LegitBS tweeted the uh, Spark um, troll 
tweet, hopefully troll tweet. We even spent a couple days trying to hack Spark support into this, and it's almost there. So uh, it's pretty uh, extensible. Um, so this is uh, what a user that's using Anger might see. You know, it's very easy up there. You just import it, boom. Uh, open up uh, an example um, binary, and then we'll go into all of the analyses and all of the things that Anger offers um, later in the demos. Um, Anger has several different components. Uh, of course, we have a, a binary loader that's pretty general. Um, right now, ELF is our best supported uh, platform, but uh, we can load PE files. We can't do much with uh, PE files yet. Um, but we can load them and start executing uh, until we hit some environment interactions. Um, we, uh, you know, of course, support Linux, FreeBSD, uh, uh, binaries, and so forth. And we even support um, firmware images. So if you have uh, a dump off of a, you know, IoT device um, and it's some firmware blob, Anger can load it, tell you where it's likely it needs to be loaded in memory, and you can start analyzing it. Um, we have a lot of static analysis routines. Um, Fish will talk about them in more detail. And we have a symbolic execution engine. Um, and the symbolic execution engine, of course, is capable of you know, identifying uh, unsafe uh, situations and reversing what input needs to be provided to drive a program down a specific path. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, we'll start with symbolic execution. Whoa. And we're done. <laughs> it's been uh, nice talking to you guys. Um, I'm sure this is one of the first of many situations. Yes. Awesome. And now it's no longer full screen. Awesome. And OK. We're almost there. We're almost there. Boom. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the first demo. Uh, all right, so we'll start with symbolic execution. Uh, symbolic execution is a concept that has uh, been around for a little while, and it's recently uh, gaining more and more prominence. I don't know if you guys have been uh, to yesterday's talk about symbolic execution another, uh, on another analysis system. Um, this is kind of an analogous uh, thing. So let's dive into what symbolic execution is. Um, symbolic execution aims to answer the question of how do I trigger a certain path uh, or a certain condition, right? Um, and so you might imagine a binary that does something when you give it a, a certain input, like a crack me CTF challenge, which we'll look at later. Um, and uh, how, how would you uh, interact with that? You could just give it input. You say, here's a, a, a guess. Is it good? And it'll tell you no, because you know most likely you're not going to guess the flag. Um, you can uh, try to do some sort of uh, static analysis. So this is what you know you tend to do in IDA manually when you're looking at at a binary and you know clicking through here and there. Um, and you can do that automatedly, but uh, most likely uh, static analysis will uh, not give you an answer because it's not precise enough. Um, we'll talk more about static analysis uh, later on. But for now, we need something slightly different. We need um, symbolic analysis, symbolic execution. And so what does that entail? Well, symbolic execution, we interpret an application. Um, as we interpret it, we uh, track constraints on uh, symbolic variables. And when a required condition is triggered, when we see a path that we like, we concretize the inputs to uh, identify uh, possible or concretize the uh, variables to identify a possible concrete input. Let's do a quick example uh, of concretization. Um, you know, if you have a constraints on a symbolic variable x, and you say x is greater than 10 uh, and x is less than 100, then you can do a con uh, constraint solve. Okay, we're back. You can do a constraint solve and uh, come up with a number, 42. Of course, in this case, it's uh, it's super trivial. In general, this is an NP complete problem, and um, it's kind of a, a pain that sometimes you'll start a con uh, constraint solve and it will just never finish. Um, that's one of the challenges of symbolic execution, and we'll go into another one shortly. Um, so let's go for an example program. This is in Python, of course. 
Angular uh, analyzes uh, binaries, not Python, but Python is more approachable. Um, bonus points if you can catch the vulnerability in this program, by the way. Uh, so, first thing we do uh, with symbolic execution is, uh, you know, go uh, line by line interpreting the program. So we hit um, this input, right? You see in blue, the input's been executed. Uh, that input created a symbolic variable x. x is unbounded. It has no uh, known constraints on it. Uh, and then we continue executing. Uh, and we'll hit this branch. And what some execution does when it hits a branch is it splits. Splits into two possibilities. Um, and so one of the possibilities is when uh, x was greater than 10 and that branch was taken. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, the inverse of that. x was less than 10. Um, and so we continue executing. Uh, now we have two states. So keep that in mind. Some execution has multiple states. We'll see why that's a problem uh, later on. So now we have two states and we hit the next branch in one of the, uh, in the one state that is not done yet. And it splits as well according to the two uh, different um, uh, possibilities. And so then if you want to answer the question of what does it take to print two in, in this scenario, right? In order to print two, we have our constraints. We have that state that the path that made it there. Uh, and we do a constraint solve. And the constraint solve uh, tells us that, hey, you can put in 99, or it can tell you 42, and so forth. And then we can give that uh, dynamically to the program, launch it, and uh, see uh, the expected behavior. Um, so let's do a demo of kind of a very simple uh, binary that has kind of this toy back door that we want to detect uh, with symbolic execution. Uh, this keep calm is not for you, it's for me, because uh, I did, stupidly did a, whoops, git pull right before uh, doing this, and so I don't think it works anymore. So we might have to switch to Fish's laptop. Can you uh, zoom it to me a little bit? Absolutely, man. Can everyone see that? Awesome. So, we'll launch it. Damn it. Okay, we will switch to Fish's laptop for this demo. This is, uh, this is what live demos are all about, guys. It's Python exceptions. Here you go. So uh, Fish uses Windows. It's, I know it's embarrassing, but bear with us. I mean, you know, like, in this kind of situations, Windows never fails. At least, at least it's a Linux VM. Yeah, that's nice. All right. Oh, yeah, by the way, um, Angular currently only supports Linux, but in the future, it will, it will be able to run on Windows. Allegedly. So, uh, this is a uh, Angular management. This is Angular's GUI. Uh, to do symbolic analysis uh, and static analysis, right? So if you're gonna uh, look at this uh, toy binary we have, that's nice for testing, nice for explaining what symbolic execution means. Um, okay, and let's look at it in IDA first, actually. As I said, of course, everyone uses IDA, or actually, we have the, the source code. Yeah, we do. You don't have it called? Great. All right. So we'll just look at it. Um, the, uh, this binary is a binary that uh, asks. Ah, uh, we do have the source code. All right. So here is. Is it readable? Awesome. All right, guys. If you can't read this, then we're screwed. Okay. So it's a very simple binary, right? It uh, has a username and password. It uh, takes the username and password as input, 
and uh, it calls the authenticate function. If that returned one, it says you've been accepted, right? The authenticate function has a backdoor. It has a, a secret password. If you, it, you uh, pass this string compare, which it has this string sneaky, then you'll be authenticated automatically, right? So it's possible to detect this automatically in anger management. So here's the GUI. Um, over here, we have the display um, of what paths are currently active in the analysis. Um, we can actually even run multiple analyses at the same time, right now we're just running the one. We can step these paths, um, and we can look at uh, what's present currently in their registers. Uh, presumably, if you can scroll somehow. Ah, okay. Ah. And uh, in their memory. So this is what's currently on the stack. Um, so then, we, uh, we can take this path, and we can step it. We can say, let's execute until it branches, like we saw in the other example, right? So here, we have a path that branched. Uh, and it branched for, you know, some reason, and that reason is because uh, there's user input that was symbolic variable that could be concretized to anything. And so here, we can actually look at it. Uh, all right. We can look at this user input, and we see that in, fish, I can't use your mouth. Ah. Oh, I'm touching. All right, I'm a noob. Uh, but we can see that on one hand, it uh, concretized, the user could input any password, and it does one thing. And if he, the user inputs a password so sneaky, it does another. If you then look at um, standard output instead, and we keep stepping, there. We'll see that here, where the user input um, so sneaky, it immediately trusted him and let him in. So this is a simple example of how symbolic execution can help us uh, analyze uh, binaries. And then we'll go on to more complex ones for CTF challenges. So, um, yeah. So, let's, uh, there. No, oh, come on, why did that refresh? Great. That was my temporary DEF CON password. It's gone. Great. Yeah, let's keep going on yours. I'll pull it back up. People tell me not to use Linux for presentations, but I don't believe them. I think it's just fine. You know, Windows magically works. But it's dark magic. All right. So, um, oh, well, now it's you. Great. So, uh, along with symbolic execution, Anger supports a bunch of static analyses uh, that Fish will go into detail. Yeah. With now. Okay, uh, I just figured out that Yao has taken up too much of my time, so uh, I'll keep this part really simple, and I'll just go, um, like, talk about a little bit about it, and if you guys are really interested in it, you should um, come to my lab and be a PhD student. Okay, so let, let's, uh, let's start. Before analyzing a binary, we, also, we all need to know the control flow. If you open up a, a binary in IDA, what do you see? The first, the first thing you see is a property box. After you click on OK, after several other settings, you see a control flow graph. We also do the same. In our anger management, that's our GUI, um, we will show you the control flow graph of every single function, which is like very similar to IDA's. What's the difference? Our CFG is more accurate. Our CFG has more options that you can, um, that you can adjust. And the result is our CFG is, more, is much slower. Uh, that is because we, we support multiple options like contact sensitivity level, support like smart backward slicing, symbolic traversal, et cetera, to automatically resolve some, some stuff that is really hard to resolve um, like normally or statically. For example, uh, jump targets. Or another example, some virtual table pointers. 
Well, like in comparison, IDAS CFG is less accurate. It has fewer options, but it's really faster. This is this is how we use uh, how we create a CFG in Angular. First line import Angular. Second line of Python, you create a project, the fallware, which is a binary name. Third line, you you say CFG equals to p dot analysis dot CFG. Press enter, and then it will give you a CFG. We we uh, we want to see how many nodes there are, how many basic blocks there are. If there are 78. Great. So if you want to have a faster CFG and uh, and uh, you don't want to buy IDA, you can check out Gorscott. Gorscott is a is a fast mode CFG uh, CFG generation that does not do any uh, symbolic solving. If there's a Gorscott, there's also a Boyscott. So what is a Boyscott? You can check out the binary. Uh, you can check out our project and have a look. All right. Um, another static analysis routine that we have in Angular is called value set analysis. Uh, value set analysis is a kind of abstract interpretation. In case uh, some of you guys have, uh, haven't heard of abstract interpretation, uh, it's basically a kind of static analysis, uh, a, t a bunch, a bunch of static analysis um, approaches that allows you to only execute part of the program. For example, if there's a uh, there's a loop and it loops for 1,000 times, we look in, in abstract inter interpretation, we only execute it for like three times, and then we kind of figure out the uh, semantics of the program with only executing part of the program. So that that gives us the possibility of actually enumerating, uh, sorry, exhausting uh, the state space because we're not executing all uh, all the programs. We're not ex we are not really exhausting the state space. On top of that, uh, we can have re uh, variable recovery. We can have range recovery, and then on top of that, we can build some memory access checks and type inference. Okay, so credit goes to not me. We take the paper and we implement them. The credit goes to the uh, the author of this paper, which is Gogo Balakrishnan. I tried so hard to read your name. Uh, I think I tried my best. If I read it incorrectly, I'm sorry. So he's the creator of VSA, value set analysis. Uh, here's an example of, of what the value set analysis looks like. Here's a piece of um, X, X64 assembly. Try hard to read it. You have five seconds. Okay, great. Uh, I think if you if you know assembly, you have already understand this program. And now we want to say, what is the RBX in the yellow score? Uh, in, the, in the yellow square. Do we know it? No, we don't. In symbolic exec um, execution, as Young said, we just keep executing it. However, there, uh, the problem is at, e at, um, at every single iteration of the loop, it has the possibility of branching out. That basically means we're going to face a state explosion. Or if you're going to have um, 1,025, uh, 25, sorry, 0x 1,025 different, uh, different states. If you are using native static analysis, RBX would be anything, because well, we are not following every single every single branch, and maybe we are only following uh, one iteration of the loop. With range analysis, we can actually tell uh, RBX is less than zero x uh, ten twenty four. Is that good enough? Can we do better? In value set analysis, um, this is one of the Value. One of the uh, the type of the values that uh, that the value set analysis is using is called stri stridded intervals. A stridded interval means a set of numbers that can be described with uh, a lower bound, uh, an upper bound, and the minimum stride between each single value and their size. So here, uh, these stridded intervals can be concretized, or it actually means nine different values that uh, I listed I listed downwards. You see, um, between zero x one, uh, between zero x one hundred and zero x one four, uh, the stride is four. That's what the stride means. So in this example, we want to say, what is RBX in the yellow square? We follow it. We follow. Uh, we take the first iteration of the loop. RBX can be from from zero to four. Take the second iteration. RBX can be from zero to eight with a stride of four. In the fourth iteration, RBX can be from zero to zero xc with a thread of four. At the fifth iteration, we figure out, oh, the loop is not terminating. What what are we gonna do, right? If the loop is like looping forever, looping forever, 
I always, I always keep looping with it. No? We perform a widen, and then now we think, oh, RBX can be from zero to uh, infinite. After that, of course, zero from, to, from zero to infinite is not accurate enough. We perform a narrowing. It comes, becomes zero and 10, 10 to with a straddle of four. In this case, it's pretty accurate. We extended the original um, value set analysis with the following two different, uh, with the following two different uh, improvements. The first one is called, we name it as limited variable relation analysis. For example, in this case, normal VSA will be able to tell the, val um, the bound of REX. REX should be five. What is RCX? Well, they don't, uh, they, don't do some, they don't do any relation tracking. They don't know that. We are doing some, lim we are doing some limited amount of, va of variable relation tracking. And then in this case, we are able to tell, oh, RCX equals to RX equal plus one, and RCX should be six. Our next in improvement is uh, we made our VSA sign this ag ag agnostic. That is, uh, we, we included an another analysis called wrapped interval analysis. So the credit goes to George A. Navas, who has the paper of uh, scientists agnostic paper uh, program analysis that published uh, like in 2012 in a programming analysis conference. And with that, our analysis of binary code, the, uh, the precision is greatly improved. And now we'll sp uh, I'll give it back to Yang, and we're going to talk about applications and real demo. All right. So all of that uh, technical talk or theoretical talk maybe a little boring, but it was necessary to get us into the actual Anger application. So here we're going to demo off a couple things that we do and that you can do with Anger. Um, first, we'll demo off a ROP gadget finder. So this isn't like a standard ROP gadget finder like, uh, I don't know, ROP gadget uh, or XROP um, that'll tell you, hey, you know, there's this gadget and this is, these are the instructions. This gadget finder tells you what the gadget does and then you can even filter it down later. Um, and of course, this is uh, implemented in Anger and it's super um, easy to use. So here's the uh, example. So we um, load a uh, CTF binary called nuclear. Uh, not from this that past CTF, but from a different CTF in the past. Um, and we just analyze it. We say we want all ROP gadgets with a maximum size of 15, find them, and we print them out. So let's um, do uh, that. Because it does semantic analysis, uh, it's a little slow. Um, so it takes, you know, about 20 seconds, maybe a little more for this guy. Um, so right now, Anger is analyzing every basic block and uh, figuring out its semantics, figuring out what registers it touches, how much it changes the stack by, um, and even uh, where it writes to um, in relation to uh, the various uh, registers that um, it uses. So here's an example gadget, right? It's a gadget at OX uh, 40F4C. In this binary, it changes the stack by OX18. It pops registers RBX and uh, RBP, uh, and it does a memory write to this address. So this is actually uh, on the stack. It does a memory write onto the stack um, and a memory read from an address that depends on RBP. Um, this gives a lot of information. In fact, our next step is to implement a ROP compiler based on this. Uh, we were hoping to have it for this time. It's not quite ready, but uh, stay tuned. Um, Another thing that I'll uh, demo off is a, uh, how we would solve a crypto challenge in anger. This is a crypto challenge in quotes. It's more of a crack me. Um, but it's uh, a cool little demo of, of anger's abilities. The challenge is um, from a white hat CTF. Um, it's a CTF that happened last month. Um, and then I was looking at the challenges later to uh, see some crypto. Um, and found this. Figured it would be a good example for you guys. So this uh, challenge uh, takes uh, input on the command line and uh, in standard crack me fashion it tells you if you're right or if you're wrong, right? And uh, in general if we try to guess, we're wrong. Let's open it up in IDA, right? We open it up in IDA, we start looking around and the binary is really big. 
So uh, of course, we can uh, start uh, drilling down um, into uh, parts of the binary, uh, figuring out what it might do. You know, we can uh, decompile it and try to figure it out. And one of the first things that uh, we see immediately is uh, it does something. Um, and uh, if this uh, returns zero, it um, says, please check again. All right, well, let's look at it. Um, then we see it does some complicated stuff, uh, but there's some equals equals eight. Of course, from here, this is my exact process of, of uh, solving this challenge. I figured, all right, that maybe it, eight is a size. Let's play with that. So I went, quit out of Ida, went to Anger. I wrote a little, uh, whoa. I wrote a little bit of code. Um, so it's just very heavily commented. This is in our examples uh, repository, if you guys want to check it out. So we uh, opened the, the binary. Um, Anger symbolic execution has trouble with certain types of code sometimes. So especially in uh, status building binaries, um, I hooked them um, with uh, Python replacements um, to help them along. Um, and then basically I ran it. I said, uh, I, I created a path group, which is the standard uh, uh, singleton, uh, or the entry point of our symbolic execution engine, and I told it to go and find um, this point. And this is the point where we say, where it says uh, it passes this stage, and it says the input is okay, right? And then it does some more processing, and this is a pain in the butt to get through, right? So I figured, Let's look at where we are at this point. And it turned out that at that point, the key space is much reduced, the possible key space that we can make it to that point in with, and it's, after that, it's brute forcible. So over here, I get the possible values from anger. Um, of course, how to do this is all in the docs, um, or you can look at this example. And then I iterate over these uh, possible values with a very fancy progress bar uh, and uh, test every possible value until I get the right one, uh, allowing me to uh, solve this uh, crypto challenge. So let's um, see how this goes. Uh, run it here. So here, uh, Anger is stepping through uh, the binary, and now it's done stepping through the binary. Um, it's at this point where the input was, uh, is tested again, um, I guess at, at this point. Um, and now it's just trying the uh, reduced set of possibilities, which is down from uh, eight bytes to 6,392 possibilities. And uh, this is its an example guess for debugging, so just iterating through the possible uh, keys that can even make it to this point and find, trying to find one that says success. Um, it should find it at the 80-ish percent mark. I'm actually pretty surprised it hasn't crashed yet. Boom. So we, found, we find it um, after iterating through a couple of possibilities. The flag is this. If we run the crypto, um, actually, this is the input. That's the flag that prints out. If we run the uh, binary, boom. So. Um, Anger is very useful for uh, these sorts of, oh dear, five minutes, all right, for these sorts of uh, challenges. Um, I'll pass it on to Fish to look at some real world, uh, or CTF that's happening now and how we're using Anger for that. So one of the Angular's uh, ability is that you load up a binary, you execute arbitrary part of the code in it. Um, I had some demos for it before I prepared like before the DevCon, but yesterday when I was playing the DevCon CTF, there's a challenge called RxC, and I figured out, hey, this is a really good demo for Angular, and now I'm going to talk about it. So if you guys are uh, playing the CTF right now and you guys haven't solved this challenge, this is a little benefit for you. Cover your ears, please. Uh, RxC is a uh, ALF 64-bit um, binary. It's pretty big, 
reversing it is a little bit hard. And we spent a long time reversing it. Before we reversed it, we got some suspected drop chains from the traffic. So we want to figure out, hey, there's a there's a drop chain. What does this drop chain do? I mean, we can we can we can definitely hire a bunch of monkeys to figure it out, but we have anger. The monkey you'd hire would be ourselves anyways. Okay. So this is our uh this is our uh drop chain execution. Uh drop chain execution um program called DROP. You pass in the drop chain, load the binary RIC, and then I Dump all the drop chain on our our stack. Uh, yes, on the stack. I create a state. I dump the dump the drop chain on our stack. Uh, our stack. I set the IP, and then I execute it. Uh, I'm, I'm using our one of our surveyors called the Explorer. Execute it, and then I return a run that returns. Let's run this. Let's run this program. Python drop chain dot pi. Okay, we we return the first um the first drop chain. Mm, bummer. Okay, it's called uh. Okay, it's called R. Very descriptive uh, variable names. Yeah, the there's a unconstrained path. So of course this is all. Uh, it has five runs. Fairly technical, but uh, you you can read the documentation, understand yeah. what's going on here, and now exactly. you see. Oh, this is where the, the exact exact path that the drop chain is following. And now, of course, you have the ability to read every single state of every single program point along this drop chain, which is really easy. It can also help you debug your own drop chain and shellcode, right? All right, let's terminate this uh, this example, and then the next example is for the same binary. In this binary, there's a really interesting uh, function. There's a it, it does some encryption, and later later on we figure out oh it's T. We want to call it. We don't want to implement by ourselves because like when we're writing an exploit, implementing some C code in Python is really uh, tedious. What do we do with? It? What do we do about it? Luckily, we have Python. Uh great. So there's another program I wrote. It's really small, called callable. What it does is, um, it it takes in it takes in a data and, and it takes in a data at length, and then encrypts it with the exact program. Uh, sorry, the exact function in the, uh, in that RxC program, with the exact encryption uh, encryption function. So it so you uh, you know it has like 30, 30 something li uh, lines of code, and then you don't need to understand the encryption function anymore. You spawn up, you spawn up Python, and it automatically encrypts it for you. Let's try it. Python, callable.py. This is original data, high def con, eight bytes, and then you get encrypted data. That it all works. Um. Whoa, well, I have two microphones. Now. We also support uh, binary diffing, but in the interest of time, you can because we have one minute. You can check this out on your own, and we'll briefly talk about the CGC. Um, the CGC, as you guys hopefully know, is the Cyber Grand Challenge. That's the machine, um, one of the machines that'll be running the uh, finals, um, where uh, machines will battle each other uh, for hacking supremacy next DEF CON. Um, Shellfish participated in the Cyber Grand Challenge, uh, and uh, we managed to qualify. What's going on? Uh, if you're no longer presenting. Yeah, right, go back. This is a very clever set of slides. That's good. All right. Shellfish participated in the Cyber Grand Challenge. Uh, we managed to qualify, putting us from uh, just another CTF team into the richest CTF team in the world, along with the other ones that qualified. Um, with the CGC, we created a cyber reasoning system that created uh, exploits from binaries and patched them. Um, it was very complex, and anger actually uh, sat at the core of every component. 
um, which is pretty cool. So check out this system. It's a real world system with real world uh, uses and we like it. Um, and it's open source, as I mentioned. Um, it's open source with special thanks to uh, our professors, um, DARPA, with uh, two different projects that, that Anger was developed for. Um, and uh, of course, all of uh, you know, the, the contributors to Anger um, that we've gone over. Um, you can pull it at, on GitHub, um, check out anger.io, um, subscribe to our mailing lists, and uh, of course, we welcome pull requests, issues, questions. Um, we are hoping to make this the next generation binary analysis tool, and uh, we hope to work with you to do it. Um, Anger is two years old now, uh, with almost 60,000 lines of code, about 6,000 commits. It's a big project, and we'd love to have you uh, working on it with us. Any questions? All right, I guess no questions. Thanks. Right, thank you, guys.